Uh, Zachary Richache plays for JL Borg. He is uh, a swing wing. I think he's got a little bit more positional flexibility than than Salon did. Uh, he is listed on the team site at 6'8", 205. Now, I want to say, like, um, with Richache, I remember on the game day when we were on the court, yeah. and I don't know what it was about the, the Blazers court, but I was mm-hmm. like, why does every prospect look two inches taller here? Like, yo, Aiden Holloway looks like he's six four today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but he looked absolutely massive. Where I was like, is this dude six ten, six eleven? And uh, so big dude, big wing. Uh, he'll be nineteen years old on draft night. Uh, Twenty two point nine minutes per game, eleven point seven points per game, three point six rebounds, one point one assists, one point five turnovers, one steal, point four blocks, shooting fifty three point one percent from the floor, forty eight point. 2% from three on three and a half attempts a game, 71.3% from the line on three free throw attempts per game. True shooting percentage, 65.6. Uh, preseason stock price, ESPN had him at three. No ceilings had him at 12. Bleacher Report had him at five. Yahoo had him at six. The Athletic had him at 17. Tankathon had him at seven for an average price of 8.3. He came in at eighth on the draft act IPO. Currently, ESPN has him at two. No ceilings had him at six in January. Bleacher Report had him at six. Yahoo at three. The Ringer at three. The Athletic had him at four. Tankathon had him at three. Average price of 3.85. He is third on the January draft ranking. So, is Richiche stock price too high, too low, or is it just right? Give me just right. I I could see it. Um, and it's not too far from where I have him. I have him at five right now. So um, for him to be at three and for me to say that's too high is stupid, right? And once again, this is that draft where anyone can go anywhere and it's not crazy. So for me, Corey, three feels okay. I'm okay with it. I am also okay with it uh i believe i have him at five as well but uh i do think that you know he's a guy that i can can see continue to you know climb my board um because of the fact that he is a a two-way guy that i can actually believe in um now considering we just did the exercise with salon if you had ten dollars to invest in Richiche, Salon, and Mattis Buzelis, how would you spend your ten dollars? Damn. Okay, I'll do. Uh, whew, this is actually tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll go Richiche five, Buzelis three, Salon two. Yeah, I think I'm going to go similar 450 for Rishi Share. 350 for Buzelis and two. 2 for Salon. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's interesting that there are a number of these kinds of wings that are all kind of in the same ballpark and range and i think could any one of them can go ahead of the other given the preference by a particular front office Mm -hmm. um so you know while this draft is weird and whatever like maybe it has a little bit of uh depth that like this big wing position Mm -hmm. I, it's just it, it's interesting and, and it's funny that you brought up those three guys just because there isn't and, and i think that kind of reflected in how we kind of divvied up the ten dollars but there isn't a huge gulf in between the three guys um i know i have salon at 22 and then risa share at five but even between five and 22 i don't think there's a huge huge gap between those two guys and once again, I think that speaks to this class and how bunched up everyone seems to be. But what? how are you viewing these three guys, right? You're seeing them as like bigger wings who can shoot the ball, who might be able to give you a little extra here and there. Um, and as you mentioned, and we'll get to it later, but I think Risa Share for me gets the biggest chunk of the $10 because I'm I 
believe in his defense more than the other two guys, right? Yeah. Is how I, where I'm at right now. So um, it, it's interesting though because there are those three guys, and there are other wings too. I think in this class that are going to be kind of similar and will be viewed similarly in terms of what their roles would be uh, in the NBA as well. So a really interesting thought exercise. So uh, first off, I want to say shout out to everybody watching live in the chat. Uh, you know, if you have not subscribed yet, make sure that you hit that subscribe button, smash the like button, all that good stuff. Uh, now going into the comments, uh, Gregory Castillo says, six nine shooter, don't overthink it like Trey Murphy. And I think that's going to be an interesting way to get into our conversation about his shooting. Because he has been absolutely on fire, right, this year. Like, he is straight up sniper type percentages um, from three. I mean, on the year, he's shooting 48% from three, right? Like, crazy stuff. <laughs> Where I get a little bit of hesitancy to be like, I completely buy into his shooting is one an entire week of watching him at the hoop summit practices. Like that wouldn't have been what I was like. Yeah, he's a, a great shooter. Like it's, that's not something that I would have said about him. Right. He's also shooting 70% from the free throw line. Like, and we're going to like Trey Murphy shot 93% from the free throw line. His last year of college, like Trey Murphy was a legit shooter. And even the year before on, you know, because it wasn't that much volume, um, Trey Murphy had shot like 83% or whatever. So, like, this is a dude who you knew was an elite, elite shooter where with Risha Shea, I'm almost like, I, I got to see him go through like a cold spell. I got to see what happens when his confidence wavers because, you know, like when his confidence wavers, he has been like pretty unproductive at times. And like, I, I buy the shooting, but I don't like, I'm not willing to, you know, pay a, a premium price for the shooting. Like, I, I just think it's like, he's a good shooter. I don't think he's a 48% three point shooter. Um, if he is great, <laughs> you know, but I'm, I, I, I'm a little bit hesitant to like completely buy into it where it's like, he's one of the most elite shooters in this class. Cause I just, I, I think it might just be an outlier shooting year right now. Um, and, you know, maybe he comes in and plays a similar role and he's just like mostly a spot up guy and it's, it's awesome. But some of the, the touch stuff in other areas, like, you know, when he curls uh, a screen and shoots in the mid range, like I think his touch is a little awkward. Um, I just, I, the free throw op percentage, obviously like being in the low seventies for somebody who you would think is an elite shooter because he's shooting 48% from three. I just, I'm just saying I have, a, I have some questions, some. Albert, I think you're muted. Whoops. Sorry. Um, I, I get it. And I think part of it, as you were talking about it, I thought of like Grayson Allen who is uh, currently shooting just under 50% from three on the season and having an unbel unbelievable seating, season shooting from outside. But even for Grayson Allen, like it's not a crazy anomaly just because he's playing with the Suns and he plays off of Kevin Durant and Brantley Beal and Devin Booker and, you know, the quality of shots that he's getting is great. And he's always been about a 40% shooter. Um, but he's always been 40% and this year he's at 50 so it is a pretty huge jump and it's been great for him. But also he's always been like 86%, 90% from the free throw line. So with Risa Share, Corey, I understand your reservations. I think you and I have always said like, hey, if you believe in a shooter being an elite shooter, look at their free, free throw shooting percentage. Like that's a, actually like a really important number for us. And so, I mean, even if we compare it to a guy like Reed Shepard, who is, you know, his numbers are mind blowing stuff. So I'm with you, Corey. It, it's just, I had a different experience with him at Hoop Summit because, as we've mentioned, I came like a day or two after you guys. So I got to see Risa Share practice only twice and then play in the game. Or I don't even remember if you played in the game. But um, in pra the practices that I saw, 
I also didn't walk away from those practices thinking like, oh, this guy's a dead eye shooter, but I did like him. There was something about his game that I thought was interesting. And there was one scrimmage where I think he scored like two or three buckets in a row. And I was like, oh, I like this guy. But um, I like you, Corey, did not leave Portland thinking, uh, oh, that guy's going to go back to France and shoot the cover off the ball this season Uh, was kind of just not in my notes at all. But from what I've seen, I like it. Um, he's doing it off of movement. He's doing some of it off the dribble. A lot of it, obviously, is catch and shoot. But so far, it's been good. Um, and let's just hope that, you know, he needed. And also, you know, he had a really tough summer, um, you know, where he didn't play well. And maybe he needed that to kind of get him going and to kind of find his rhythm and where he's at right now. But as you mentioned, Corey, I think we, we're going to have to continue to monitor this throughout the season to see what it looks like over the course of a full season in Europe. Yeah, and to be fair, like I think he's a good shooter. Like, yeah, there's nothing super rough about his form. Like his form's pretty good. Um, there are some about things. Elite. Yeah, exactly. I look if if I thought he if I was like he is going to be a forty percent three point shooter in the league, no doubt about it in my mind. Like if the Pistons get the number one pick, like he makes the most sense. Yeah. Like at least you know because I, I do think that you should be taking fit into account a little bit in that godforsaken situation. I put Kevin Knox. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, look, I I think that he's been good. Like you know, we just saw in that clip, like he comes off movement and he's like pretty confident, like with a quick trigger to let it fly. Um, not a whole lot of like self creation, nope. but he doesn't need that. Like yeah. spot up, repeatable. Um, and you know, he's, he's got a pretty versatile shooting profile because of it. You know, he can put that, the ball on the floor and take a dribble or two, you know, he's got a little bit of a, st- you know, a step back, like not much, but he can do it. And just to like get his balance. So I, I buy the shooting. I'm just saying like, I don't know if it's like a lock, a lock, a lock. It wouldn't, shoot, it wouldn't. And we had this conversation with Ignacio um, when we were doing our mock drafts, mm. our last mock drafts, where it's like, you know, it, it's just not a, he doesn't have a long history of being an elite shooter. So there's reason to be a little bit skeptical, but it's going in and like at a certain point, if it keeps going in and it looks good, like, you know, you gotta, you gotta buy it a little bit. So, no, I, I, the the concern is is this more of a flash than what we should expect? Um, which I get, Corey. Um, you know, I I remember back in the '90s there was like a season where, and well, not just a season, but he, even this comp isn't fair because like I was thinking about like Antoine Walker, right, with the Celtics, where he was a guy who's you know playing the four for them taking a lot of threes for that. I mean, there's one season he was, I'm looking at it right now, all-star season, he took eight threes per game, right? And, you know, a guy that eventually had weird issues with uh, free throw shooting later on, which, um, I don't know, maybe that's research I don't know. But, Corey, I, I get what you're saying. Um, when we're talking about him being an elite, elite shooter, uh, we just need to see more of it. Uh, we need to see a longer sample size for us to kind of get there. And I think a 70% free throw shooter is that that is a red flag. It, it should be like J- Julius Randall shoots better than that at the free throw line. Right. So uh, and no one is ever considering Julius Randall as an elite shooter. So I, I think it's something we have. We just have to continue to monitor. But let's say, Corey, like it, we get to the end of the season and he's still shooting the three like that and he can bump up his free throw shooting to, I don't know, high seventies by that point, maybe we'll feel a little different. Right. But even still, I think you, it, you, you're going to have some question marks about whether or not he'll be able to shoot it to that level at the NBA as well. Yeah, And look, he's still very young. He's 18. It's not yeah. like he's, you know, some, uh, you know, senior in college and he's had no history of shooting it well. And all of a sudden he's shooting it well this year. Like he's a young player who's putting in work and has gotten better. And this just could be the trajectory that he's on. And maybe you just don't overthink it because he cleaned up this one area of his game and you know, the free throws could be next. Right. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, he is shooting at a good percentage at six foot nine and you know, like, 
he's the, he's valuable if he's knocking down shots like this. And there's no reason to believe that he's not going to at least be an adequate shooter at the next level. And I feel a lot more confident in some of his ancillary skills than I do, you know, in salon. So, um, you know, like I feel a lot more confident in him using that shooting gravity Mm -hmm. to attack in a straight line, or like we're seeing here kind of grabbing and going, I think like he's got a much tighter handle Mm -hmm. than Salon. Maybe not as creative. Mm -hmm. Maybe he colors between the lines a lot more than Salon is willing to, but I feel more comfortable with the ball in his hands. You know, he doesn't have a lot of shake. He doesn't, you know, uh, there's not a lot of shift, but I, I don't get worried you know, like I'm in the passenger seat of a car and it's a yellow light. And I'm like, I don't really think that my friend who's driving should be trying to speed through this yellow. Cause I think there's a 18 wheeler coming, um, like I do with salon. Uh, so I, I, I think the ancillary stuff, I feel a lot more confident mm-hmm. with, mm-hmm. with Rishi share. Hmm. Yeah, Corey, I think, the point that you made about the handle is important where maybe we wouldn't even quantify his handle being better, but maybe we say it's different um, is maybe one way to put it. I, I'm not saying it, it is for sure, but maybe that's like how we're ultimately feeling about it just because it, it is safer. Right. And also like even his drives to the basket do feel a little bit safer, but also Corey, like, there is a thing with Risa share where because he is also another guy who doesn't have a ton of vertical pop. Um, I do feel more confident when he's going to the rim, but also there are moments where it gets a little wonky um, because of the lack of vertical, vertical pop. And there were moments I thought where like he would overextend himself trying to make something happen and try to get to the basket for a bucket. But at the same time, I would not say that he's anywhere near as bad as some of the stuff that we saw from Salon. It's just, I think it's still something that he's got to just continue to tighten up. Like, I don't think even Corey, with what you're saying, I don't think either one of us are saying that we think he's an elite finisher at the rim. It's just, he's definitely a safer finisher than what we saw from Salon is, I think, where I land at least. I think he makes way better choices. Mm. I, I mean, like, so... His percentages as a finisher, he's 72.5% at the rim, 70.6% in the half court. Now, that is on 17 attempts in the half court. Hmm. So, I don't know, like one a game, something yeah. like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, it's very low sample size. And I think it's because he's not forcing the issue like maybe Salon would be willing to, mm-hmm. you know? Um I think, you know, he's, he's more willing to make those kind of in-between choices where he will pull up in the mid range and come off a curl off movement. Like he's not a big time cutter, but he does creative things to get himself open off of the ball to get himself looks. And even if it doesn't result in him getting all the way to the rim in the half court, he's still like, you know, I I think doing positive things and, and making defenses react with the way that he moves off of the ball. And then, you know, when it comes to, playmaking like i i buy the the connective aspect Mm -hmm. of his game yeah as mr ray says like the connectivity difference is pretty dramatic between the two prospects and i agree i think that there's a trustworthiness that i have in rishishe versus salon and it's not to say that rishishe is like somebody who i'm like this dude is a genius playmaker Mm. right like um but I think that he's a good enough processor, a quick enough processor. And like, I can envision him at the next level, like the ball swinging his way. And then he's making like quick second side reads where he's attacking and then uh, dishing to the weak side, or he's like getting uh, the ball reversed to, to the wing. And he's now coming off like uh, a pick, quick pick and roll and he's able to hit the roller or whatever, or he's flying off of, you know, like a floppy set, and guys jump out at him and he's able to hit the roll there. Like I, I think he's going to be capable of that now at the same time, he has been way more of a play finisher than mm-hmm. a play creator in his role as well. But I, I definitely buy his ability to make the right play a little bit more or a lot more than I do with salon. <sighs> yeah, Corey, uh, I think you're definitely not saying you think he's some elite creator. I think he's another guy that more 
turnovers and assists, right? If I if I yeah. didn't see that wrong. So mm -hmm. um definitely wouldn't say that he's an elite creator or anything like that. But cr cr the the connective tissue stuff is definitely there. Uh, way more than what we saw from Salon. And uh, another thing with him that I like is um I, I think, and you mentioned it in passing before, but I think he's a really good cutter, dude. Uh, I think he's a really good cutter, really good off-ball mover where he he creates opportunities for himself to get open and to get cleaner looks. And um, one thing that I wanted to throw in there with his finishing, he doesn't go to it often, but I think he's a pretty good left-hand finisher too um, in, in some of the limited stuff that I saw. And um, also some nice, like, crafty, savvy, high-off-the-backboard layups um that you know show off you know some of that touch with him where you know sometimes with him not being an elite athlete and not being the strongest guy he's still kind of pretty slight in frame but some of the really high off the backboard stuff was nice to see and was a nice little wrinkle to some of his uh at room finishing so um i'm with you Corey. i, I think he's good I think, you know, offensively at least he's gonna have a lot to offer and that's why because we're more sure about his offensive game than salon that's why he ends up in the top five for a lot of people on their boards considering the size and all that and also Corey, i really do agree like he definitely looked taller to me than six eight in person but who knows i mean we'll see at the combine what all that turns out to be but it just um you feel more confident in his outlook than a guy like salon because of the more foundational skills that he has yeah, and then i buy him defensively more oh yeah big time. at this moment than I, I do with salon right like i i think that um he's been really impressive mm -hmm. defensively and like i think that because it's weird because in in person i was like you know, he's like a really good mover but like also he's he moves a little funky and again that could just be like age and growing into your body but he's looks like much more fluid on that end um something that i really love is like he's able to get skinny over screens, mm -hmm. you know, like, and at his length, like being able to like fight over screens and, and be slithery like that, I, I think is, is really impressive. Um, he's, he, and then like when he goes over and trails the screen, like he's, he's able to guard from behind mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of use his length to like at least bother shooters. Uh, I think he moves really well laterally. Yes. He, smart defender, like active hands, um, I obviously he needs to get stronger goes without saying. Right. But like plays hard fights, like very nuanced game. And, um, yeah, I think that that two way ability that he has now, like, I'm not saying that he's going to be, you know, a defensive player of the year candidate and all defense team candidate. Like, I don't necessarily feel that way, but like, I think that he's going to have real two way ability. Um, and it's, that's the kind of thing that's going to get you on the floor early and, you know, earn the trust. Like his game on both sides of the ball is, you know, um, he's effective mm -hmm. in, in, in a really simple way. And obviously defense is, is not simple. Defense is very complex, especially NBA defense, but I think he has those complexities to, and the nuance to his defensive game. And then the offense is so simple that, uh, I think he's the type of guy that will get on the floor early you know and obviously he's going to go to a team that uh is not very talented so he, he should be playing a ton and um but he's uh, he's been impressive as a two-way guy i mean Corey, i feel like you cover almost covered everything on the defensive side of the ball with him um and, and to uh wanted to give a shout out to metcalf too who wrote a great piece about risa share and his game and you know what he's been showing defensively because like some of the on ball stuff with him has been awesome and you mentioned it right he's a really good lateral mover can flip his hips a guy that can really fight to stay in front of his man too even with you know his slider frame right now it's just a it, it big time right just because of how he moves laterally it's so exciting and he's got his size and he's got his length but as he adds his strength his grown man's strength you can't help but wonder how disruptive of a defender he could eventually become even more so than what he is now right so <clears throat> if you consider all of the like so ultimately Corey, we just have less question marks about him than we did a guy like salon and if you have yeah. less question marks especially on the defensive side he has way less question marks than i i think salon does um 
you can't help but be excited and that's why he's higher on the board but with with researcher for for sure like the on ball stuff was really interesting to me and i think off ball stuff too like he just knew where to be did a good job of you know being a good team defender as well so um i i feel like you covered everything but it is what it is like he's just the less question marks he has the higher you're gonna be so uh right there with you yeah um he's he's gonna be a guy that I, you know, I think is steadily uh, in the top five conversation for the rest of this draft cycle. Um, okay, so if you're buying stock in Zachary Rishishere, who may you have bought stock in previously? We've had some good ones in the in the comments. Yo, I actually can't <laughs> see the comments right now. I don't know what's wrong with my thing, but we've got um, a uh, a Josh Eustis. Uh, we've got Keegan Murray. Uh, we've got fun Patrick Baldwin, mm. Mm. Tevin, uh, a taller Evan Fournier, mm, French, yeah. And someone brought up, um, what was the name? Trey Murphy Os- before. We got Jetty Osman. Mm. Mm. So I'm kind of along those lines, Corey. Um, I thought of taller Rudy Fernandez. Uh, was one that I thought of. If you think about how he played for the Portland Trailblazers back in late 2000s right i think we're talking late 2000s ish um oh, like a taller i mean early to how do you because he played early the, the late aughts i I, yeah. I i never know how you mean you, you you talk about that yeah. that uh the early 2000s and contextually yeah. I know what you mean. But um, anyway, Rudy Fernandez was one name that came to mind. Cam Johnson, maybe a little bit. I don't know, um, was another guy that came to mind. Bigger wing. Um, Johnson came in a lot older. But a guy who's going to shoot it from outside, compete for you defensively. A guy who's going to be a very valuable wing um, as like a play finisher type of guy as well. Um, So, yeah, I thought of taller Rudy Fernandez. Obviously less athletic than Rudy was, but kind of similar energies I thought and uh maybe a little Cam Johnson. I like those. Um I got uh maybe a little Nikola Mirotic. Hmm. Who uh Barcelona you know, looked, legend. Yeah. Bobby uh, Porter's f- favorite dude. <laughs> <laughs> um who I think that was the season that Bobby Portis punched Mirotic. Yeah. He was out for a while. The Bulls were terrible. They were going to be in position to get into the top of that draft in a real tangible way. And then Miritich came back and went on an absolutely insane so heater. Yeah. And the bulls ended up at the seventh pick and drafted Wendell Carter jr. Um, instead of drafting, being in position to draft Luka Doncic, but ultimately it probably wouldn't have mattered because all the rumors were that the front office liked Marvin Bagley anyway. So <laughs> little off, Mm. Off topic tangent there mm. from uh, my recollection of the real GM experience at that time. Uh, also, there's, you know, a little bit of Franz Wagner. Mm. Mm. Little Franz, you know, like maybe not, maybe hasn't shown as much on ball stuff, but at the same time, like there were a lot of question marks about Franz. Like people yes. forget um, that like Franz wasn't like he was the safe pick in that he he was a guy who had that high floor, but didn't, he wasn't thought of to have that high ceiling. And that's why, you know, the Warriors took Jonathan Kaminga over him and Mm -hmm. he went where he did, you know, like, because people thought he was just very safe, but because he had that really terrible, like what was like over 11 in his last college game, Mm -hmm. you know, people were like very iffy on, anything beyond that. So I don't know, like maybe there is an outcome where he turns into like some kind of version of, you know, what Franz is, you know, maybe, maybe not. I mean, Franz is amazing. So probably not, you know, it's a high bar, but like, you know, you could see it yeah. a little more on ball reps at the next level. And there's an outcome. And it's funny, Corey, cause we loved Franz and we still didn't see this coming. Um, yeah, no. we were, but I, I still remember doing his pod and we praised him for like an hour and we really, really liked his game. We thought he was built for the modern NBA. We thought he was going to be a really good complimentary player and a guy that I think both of us were like, if you take him in the lottery, no problem was how both of us felt. And, um, and yet neither one of us, I think saw this coming. So, no. Um, maybe it's the same thing with Risa Share, right? Where both of us, you know, we have them top five because of this class, 
right? And we see him as like a really good play finisher, shooting from outside, defensive guy. And then maybe he gets to the league and he blossoms even more into maybe a Franz type. It, it can definitely happen because we definitely didn't see it with Franz and look at what he's become. So maybe the same can happen here. Yeah, right situation, right development plan, right yeah. opportunities. Um, so we'll see. You know, I mean, looking at the top of the draft, uh, you know, there are some, I don't know how many teams I'd be stoked outside of like San Antonio, mm. you know, <laughs> like, like even Portland, who I, I think if Portland were able to draft him, like they have a great young core, but they also have a thousand six foot nine yeah. wings. Um, so maybe they just, you know, kind of give him the keys for that role because, you know, he'd be a high pick, but you, there's no guarantee of that. Right. Um, I kind of like him next to Brandon Miller Yeah, in Charlotte. I think that'd be fun. Um, the wizards would be, I mean, I like him next to Koulibaly, but I, I guess it depends what happens with Kuzma and Jordan pool Jordan and Poole. that mess. The Pistons would be a really good mm. fit too. Mm. Um, so he's, I mean, he's a guy that you could just kind of throw anywhere and it works, right? He'd look good next to Scotty Barnes. Yeah. Wow. Toronto. Him, Asar, Cade, pretty interesting. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, and if the shooting's real, mm -hmm. then that becomes, you know, Shit. then that becomes really interesting because they need somebody where the shooting's going to be real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They need it. Mm-hmm. And then if he just plays defense like this and better with Asar, good lord. Yeah. Fun. All right. Again, it is that time, Albert. I need you to uh -huh. sell me this pen on Zachary Richechere. I don't think I've ever done a two for one like this uh, in terms of selling pens. And also, I haven't sold pens in a while. So this feels incredible, but also feels really sudden. But uh, when it comes to Zachary Richechere, we're talking about a guy who um, has like great NBA jumbo wing size, a guy who could, has shown this season that he can really shoot the ball, a guy who we believe um, may be able to show more with the ball in his hands next season. Pretty good passer, nothing special or elite about his passing, but good connective tissue to him. Um, obviously, on the defensive side of the ball, we like what we've seen on ball, off ball, team defense, all that stuff. So if, if you're looking for a two-way wing with really good size, that we believe is going to be able to add, you know, a good amount of muscle as well, um, who maybe one day becomes like a number one, number two option, even if all the cards fall right. And, you know, the 1% outcome happens, who knows what he could eventually be. And, you know, we obviously talked about even a guy like Franz Wagner as an example, but Risa shares a really interesting prospect because of his baseline foundation uh, and the skill set that he has with also the, ceiling or maybe lack of ceiling in terms of what he can become so a really interesting two-way wing that you should feel pretty good about if you take him in the top five in the upcoming 2024 nba draft 